everybody had a great day today. Yes. Yes. This is the last talk. I hope you don't fall asleep. I will do my best for that. Um, to start, who are the developers in this room? Who considers himself a WordPress developer? That's awesome. I can talk some geeky things. Um, who considers himself a PHP developer? And who considers himself a full stack developer? Oh, this is a really good. Okay, so I'm gonna need to up my level a little bit here uh, for the talk. That's that's great. Um, good. Automating WordPress. Uh, but first, um, my name is Johan Janssens and I'm a Joomla co-founder. Now you would ask yourself, what does a Joomla co-founder and a formerly developer does in WordCamps? Well, um, actually this is us, uh, part of the 70 co-founders of Joomla. There are two Dutch people here, uh, Arno and Tringi, so Joomla uh, in a sense is also a little bit Dutch. Um, we started this 20 years ago, uh, and we were most known, or still most known, for a document management extension called Document. You might know, or you don't, but I started as a volunteer working on this 20 years ago, when I started writing my, own, my first little lines of, of free software. And recently, the last couple of years, more and more people started asking us, can you also make this for WordPress? So that's what we did. This is not a talk about that, but if you want to check it out, there's the URL. Uh, so we have also built our document management extension for WordPress. You can find that there. That's what brings me here. I want to learn more about the WordPress community. And I was trying to do that with a little talk about automating WordPress. I send in, I think, five or six different topics. And this was the one I chose. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but then again, this was the one. So I was like, okay, let's do something with that. Uh, how do you automate WordPress? And, and when I talk about people about that, I always go like a little bit earlier, I was talking about, yeah, I'm going to do this talk about automating WordPress. And the first thing that told me was, but Johan, talk for that. We already have plugins for it. Plugins on the plugin directory, you can find an enormous amount of plugins that help you to do exactly that. It's true. So I'm not going to talk about any of those plugins. You can find them there, you can check them out, but what if we want to automate WordPress without any plugins? And why would we want to do that? Why is it actually sometimes better to do automation without going for plugins? Well, because less is more, and less is also a little bit profitable more. Uh, as you've seen from the first couple of talks this morning, as I understand it, a lot was about sustainability and performance and optimizing your sites and dealing with all of that. And you've learned that the more plugins you install in your site, the slower the site will eventually become. You may need caching and optimizations to help solve that problem, right? <clears throat> okay, with automation, that's a different problem because you cannot cache automation. But that doesn't really work. So if you start adding automation plugins to your site, eventually the site is going to become quite slow with all the background tasks that it's going to start doing in the background. Now why is that? All PHP developers among you, oh this is a speaker who asks questions. Question, why is it not so good to do automation tasks with WordPress? It's a PHP question. It lives once, it dies after the execution. So it could die. No state management. No state management. Yes, another one? Because WordPress is not made for command line by itself. Right. And automation is usually done in yeah. command line. Good one. Another one? Doesn't have like a queuing system? Yes, no queuing system, definitely. Another one? Chrome job could be executing during the Exactly, you need to go to cron jobs and they need to be available. And then you also, if you don't do cron jobs, you're ending up with yes, during the request. Yeah, 30 seconds problems. You have a scheduler. All right, so a little bit of context. Um, I'm calling this, this is a little bit of history. Five minutes of web history. How do we get here? Like, how do we go to this place called WordPress? Um, maybe because I come from a very different background that I can try to bring this to you a little bit. So very in the very beginning, there was nothing but HTML. And everybody was a front-end guy. The world was simple. There was no PHP developers, there was no full-stack developers, there was no Unicode.js. It was all HTML. And it was pretty simple. We had this thing called the URL, and in 1999, the web was born. And this was the first ever web 
page. You can actually still go to it. It still exists. Um, now, it looks like that, but I'll go one back. This is the first ever web server. Who created this? Who set it up? A strange guy called Tim. Tim uh, exactly, right? So this is a picture of Tim his first web server. It was actually running on his desk. It sat on his desk at CERN. Uh, and he had this sticker. It's not completely clear here. But it says, this machine um, is, a server. is a server. Do not power down. Because if you power it down, you would take the website down. Yeah, not the website. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The whole internet in 1990 was basically running from that single machine. Um, and this was, well, it's a copy of it, but this is the first web page. And this is what it looked like. A little bit of information about web servers, people history, and, and first web page running at, at, at CERN. This is how it started. And we had this thing called HTML, hypertext markup language, which we used to create our websites with. And the first spec, you can find there, and it looked like this. Are there still designers here that remember HTML 2.0? Ever worked with it? Who did? Yes, there, sure. And the great thing about HTML 2.0 is that? Tables. Ah, tables. <laughs> you said good thing. <laughs> the, the mighty tables. When we, were, when we were doing websites in Dreamweaver with mighty tables, and we were putting everything in there. Uh, iframes. Iframes, yes. Uh, the great thing about HTML 2.0 is that it actually still works today. You can still build something in HTML 2.0 and it will still work in, in, in your browser. This website, well, this page, still works. Um, at that time, everything was in capitals and uh, it looked a little bit different, but this is actually a working HTML 2.0 site. And if you go to this, little URL here, you can actually find the whole history of HTML and how it has evolved over the years. It's actually quite interesting to see how this living standard that we have today is constantly evolving. And it constantly evolves faster and faster. We went from a version standard, calling it HTML2, 3, 4, to a 5, and now a living standard, which basically means it will constantly continue to evolve. That also makes us now front-end developers and back-end developers, basically meaning those who understand the evolution of HTML and those who became clueless. <laughs> right? I, I became clueless. So this is as far as I go. This is it. Okay, good. Uh, this is all great. But then, then you have this table problem you were talking about, right? So you were putting, you were using Dreamweaver or front page or Notepad? Dreamweaver? Are there front pages among you? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Note patterns or text editors or vimmers? Any vimmers? Yes, some vimmers there. Hardcore in the back. On vim HTML. Love it. Um, this is great, but then, ah, you know, it's really slow. Uh, we need to find a way to build those pages faster. Uh, we need to have something we call dynamic so that we can put some sort of like logic in between and it's not all static HTML we craft, but we can start doing something more dynamic with it. Call it the dynamolytic area. Uh, 1995. And this is where PHP comes in. In 1995, PHP FI was announced. Quiz question. What does PHP FI stand for? Formal stage. And the FI? Oh. And the FI? Formal FI. I don't know. Forms interpreter. Forms interpreter. Uh, so in 1994, Erasmus started working on PHP, which in the beginning was a simple uh, CGI script. He had a couple of uh, CGI scripts for the hackers among you. Uh, this is how we used to do these things like long ago. They actually still work. Um, and the problem that he was trying to solve was how can I extect, extend my web forms uh, and how I can, can I easily communicate with a database? So how can I start getting data from a database and putting data into a database? That was where PHP was originally built for. That's the idea behind the language. So creating simple dynamic web applications. Um, now, that's all great. And it looked a little bit like this. 
So I can probably zoom here in a little bit so you see here. Right? So this is how PHP started originally in the PHP 2 version. Like it's very, very much like a templating language, which was also the idea. You would be putting little uh, scripts, little instructions in between your HTML to make it dynamic. That's the original idea. And now I'll take this away. <coughs> so what you see here, a method, if substring, uh, from a variable, you could get an environment variable uh, from, oops, go down back. You could get an environment variable, and you had an and if statement here, a little include to include an additional file. Very, very much template language. Now, that was not sufficient. So in 1993, uh, in 1997, Ziv and Andy started and built PHP 3 which was the base of the modern PHP that we know today. And that looks a little bit like that. If you go back to a PHP 3 script, and you go back to very early WordPress, you go back to very early Joomla, this was basically what it looked like. It was getting data from a database, and then at some point, generating some HTML, and then outputting a page. And it was a mix of database calls, generating HTML. Now, why am I getting here? Because this is the key to how PHP works, and it's also the key reason why PHP isn't really good at automation. And it goes a little bit into the direction of the stateless, but there's another reason for this. <clears throat> Too hard question, sorry. Yes, and it does what? It needs to? Wait. Well, you're almost there. So it goes top to bottom, and each time it does an I.O. call, selecting the database, querying the database, fetching the uh, data from the database, each time it does that, it's waiting. It's not doing anything. PHP is not an async language. It cannot do multiple things at the same time. And when you're rendering HTML like that, that's no problem, because we need to wait until all the HTML is rendered anyway before we can send it out. Unless we do jump encoding and things like that, it gets a little bit more complex there. But normally, render the whole page, send it out. So this works perfectly for this use case. But when you're automating, you don't want that. You don't want to need to wait for each thing to happen. You want to have multiple things happening at the same time, which is a lot harder with default PHP. Right? So PHP is not a async language. It's a sync language. Each I.O. call that you make, takes time to execute and you're waiting. Case in point, the more data rate squares your WordPress site makes, the slower the page will render. Right? The more data it needs to fetch, the more files it needs to read, the slower that page will render. So we went from making dynamic pages into something that, you know, dynamic pages are great, but we don't our customers cannot edit them. We need to have something that is dynamic, that is easy to use, so that a customer can easily edit our site and update it. Why is that great? That's the profit part and the fun part of the talk. <coughs> oh, come on, guys. It basically means that you can go to the Bahamas and you need to worry about it and the customer can do the stuff, right? And then you can basically reply to your support email from the Bahamas saying, oh, no problem, just click that button, click save, and it will be all great, right? This is us optimizing our time, right? Being smart about it, making more profit, and having more fun. Exactly, <laughs> we're getting there. So, you know, the, in essence, WordPress was not created, well, it was created by Matt because he believes in all, everything GPL, he does. But he's also a really smart guy who was optimizing his time. And the same thing for Dries. If you look at why Dries created Drupal, which was called Drop in the beginning, he was like, yeah, you know, I don't want to do all that work myself. Let somebody else do it and let them pay me for not doing anything at all. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was sitting in the meeting room earlier, and there was, I'm not sure who there were there, there were two guys talking, and he said, yeah, um, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to do a little bit of support and then we're going to tell the customer to do this and this and that so that I don't need to do it. And I was like, yeah, case in point. 
This is why you're working with WordPress. You don't need to do it. Um, so there we go, 2003, WordPress was created. Making it easy, and you know all of this, making it easy to, uh, to create websites and making it easy for your customers to update them. What I found very interesting is this link, uh, 2015, where the WordPress is, des is described as a factory that makes web pages. And that's again why it's not ideal for automation, because that's not the intent. The intent of WordPress is to make it easy to generate and update web pages. And that's something that PHP is really, really, really good at. Because it was specifically built for that. But it was not really built for automation of tasks. So WordPress has a template, a web template system using a template processor. That's the core of it in a sense, which in essence is the core of PHP. A little bit of HTML, some instructions in between, generating HTML. Of course, in the meantime, you have built how many plugins already? 60,000. It's insane, right? Yes. 60,000 plugins to do all sorts of things, which in some way have something to do with, with that. But a lot more too. So you went from solving that problem to solving a lot more problems at the same time. So. Case in point, yes, you can use plugins to automate WordPress, and there's probably a lot of good, good ones out there. I don't know them. I'm not a WordPress expert. But it's not always ideal. It's not always ideal because PHP isn't really built for that purpose. And you're slowly, if that automation process becomes more mission critical, are going to jump and, uh, against the limitations of it. Like if you don't have Chrome, Everybody knows a little bit what Chrome is. If you don't have Chrome, you need to go to the WordPress scheduler, which is this built-in mechanism to at least do a little bit of automation. That's a very crude workaround for the problem. It works for small things, definitely. But for mission-critical processes, not always. And when it starts failing, it's really, really hard to debug that part, understanding why and where it fails. All right. If you don't agree with that, I'm happy to have a beer with you later over it. We can a little fight and see like what I can learn from you about it, but at least this is where I get. Good. So, so now you 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 guys conquered forty percent of the internet. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. You guys conquered forty percent of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so humble. So you. you conquered forty percent of the internet. Yes, of course we did. So it's 40% of it, that's a lot of sites. And, and the great thing about so many sites is that, well, there's a great thing about it, and then it's also you can maintain all of them. So you need to have some more automation to get all that done, right? So you're now coming at a point that you have this new problem. You have so many sites, and you need to automate, and you also need to integrate them with other tools. So there we go. Now I want to introduce a couple of tech topics. I need to figure out how deep we're going to go here. So if I start going too deep, and you start drowning, start yelling, put your hand up, please. So how do you do this? How do you automate and make systems on the internet talk to each other? How does that work? We created something for that called REST. Ever heard about it? Yeah. Who knows what it is? All right, who has no clue? Not good. So I can teach you something new then. Um, so the guy who created this is Roy Fielding. Um, Roy is also the founder of the Apache Foundation, um, if, you, if you know that. And he's one of the people that helped to create the HTTP 1.0 and 1.1 specs. So he knows his stuff. When Roy created the REST in 2000, and he, he did a, uh, a dissertation on it, it was called Representational State Transfer. Meaning, how do I transfer state from A to B? Because on the internet, you don't transfer data. You transfer a representation of that data. Still following? That's the idea. If I have data in my database, right, and I render that into HTML, that HTML representation is not the actual data anymore. Because I can send that HTML around, and in the meantime, the data on my database is changing. 
So the, the representation is only valid for the time it was created. Are we still following? <coughs> All right, good. So how do we solve that on the internet? We're sending data around and we're adding additional information called headers, HTTP headers, and one of those headers is called the date header, which includes the actual date that that piece of information was generated. The representational state transfer. We are transferring the state at a specific point in time. Basically, the internet is one big uh, solid state machine in, in that sense. All right, but that's maybe a little bit too far. Um, so how does this work? How does REST work? What is specific about REST? What makes two systems over the internet to be able to talk to each other? Why can't you open up a web page on your browser? Yeah. Connection? HTTP? And what does HTTP do? The method. A method? Which method? Yeah, it mostly gets. Get? Right? So we have a number of standardized methods uh, that are part of the HTTP protocol and that are also described because REST is basically it's not the protocol itself, it's, it's, a, it's a way of using HTTP in a uniform way. That's basically what REST tries to do. It basically says, use it like this. If everybody starts doing it, then systems can start talking to each other. So when, when we have a browser, the browser will send a request to a server, and the server can have resources, an HTML page, an image, or additional information, like, like user information, for example. Um, it will have different methods, get, post, put, delete, and which other ones we also have for the geeks among you? Yeah. Patch. Uh, head. Head. Options. 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 One more? There's also connect, but... Um, <coughs> good, good. So, but the most important ones are get, post, put, delete, and then there's also a uh, um, patch now. So it's a little bit hard to explain, so I'm not going to go there. Get basically means tell a server to, to get me something. Right? Get me some information. It could be an HTML page, it could be something else. Post means updating data. Updating data? Right? And put means? Create. Create. And, and post means? Update. Update. Is that, how is that different? Uh, well, create, you create something that doesn't exist on the receiving end. Okay, and we do that with? Put. With put? Post. 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 See, this is, this is like geeks starting to like, oh my god. And then you can have these this long winded discussions over beer. No, it's post, it's put. And then we have a team meeting, they go like, yeah, we should do this with put. It should be post. And, and nobody post. seems to agree, but you're almost there. Okay. So, so post is done against a URL that doesn't exist yet. I can post against a collection. I can say articles. I can post, yeah, I have slash articles. I'll write it up. So this is me going a little bit geeky for the, for the geeky guys here. I'll take one more minute and then we're gonna be back on track with the less geeky stuff. Because otherwise their minds are gonna start becoming dull and they get like, you know, they start falling asleep. So you have articles. Right, like this. I can do a post against this to add an article. Yeah. Right? If I have articles one, yeah, I would usually update article one. If I do a post against this and article one doesn't.